we have to start with the top story because 2020 is looking a lot like 2019. More new records. The S&P, Dow and NASDAQ all posting all time highs. But there are a couple of big events that could shake things up in the coming days, beginning with that big jobs number tomorrow. The expected signing of the phase one trade deal next week. Now, Iran is calmed, but it's not gone. And everyone seems to be guy wondering about the Fed. So how should investors be getting ready for all of this in the macro setup with a market that just cannot be held down? Yeah, and I've said it for a while that I've, I've, I've definitely made this more complicated than it has to be. And it's interesting, you know, the big knock against Bitcoin is it's created out of thin air. But quite frankly, that's exactly what the Federal Reserve has been doing since September. They've been creating liquidity out of thin air. And to me, that's all that's juicing this market. I mean, now you're north of $400 billion over the last three and a half months. By April, the Fed balance sheet at record levels. That's really it. I mean, jobs are important. Yes, China deal, all those things, this overrides everything. So as long as the Fed keeps playing this game, I think the market keeps vaporizing higher. And that's exactly what it is. This is indiscriminate buying. There are at least 20 different indicators, metrics, name it what you want, that are at levels that are historic in terms of being overbought or upside risk, yet the market doesn't seem to care. And things we look at when you talk about, we talk about the AAII bull bear spreads, and we're basically at a spread of, of you know, effectively where we were at the wides. We pulled in a little bit earlier in the week. If you want to look at CNN's got a greed and fear index, we're at a 90. What's that mean? Well, you know, extreme greed is 95. And we were at a minus one back in Christmas Eve of 2018 when everyone was about to jump out of a window. Uh, if you think about the Fed, and this is really, I think we're universally uh, accepting of the fact that the Fed is the reason behind most of this. I know we got a trade deal. I know we got this and that. But the Fed is your back. You had Fed Clarita vice chair out there again today giving you some indication easy as she goes until mid-year. And also, when you talk about this repo crisis, the sense is the Fed's going to be buying at least $60 billion in bills in the short end of the market for the next few months, which means they're going to continue to grease the liquidity scale. That means that on some level, on some level, valuations don't matter. I know the dean's going to be here talking about that. But at some point, valuations do matter, and, and I think they're starting to. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, that's fundamentally what we use as fundamentals to value stocks. And I hate when they sort of levitate on nothing because the bar gets higher and higher and the earnings expectation gets higher. And so it's a lot easier to miss. And I, that wouldn't be surprising to see that. I mean, I look at the volatility index today down 7 percent, right? I mean, it's tw under 13. So I own S&P puts. I need to protect the long side. And I mean, it's just volatility, volatility getting crushed. Falling, Nobody cares. Karen, at a time when missiles were flying from mm. Iran at right. U two U.S. air bases in Iraq. 72 hours ago, things looked very different. Right. I, I mean, to me, the VIX, you got to own it if you want to stay long stocks because it's too cheap. I, I think the balance sheet, to Guy's point, Tim's point, balance sheet is what caught most people off guard. Adding liquidity is what caught most people off guard. I think you're going to get an opportunity to sell the, the market on China, January 15th. Now? Yeah, you could sell it in phase one because there's going to be a gap between phase one and phase two. And earnings. I think earnings could surprise to the downside. There, there's your opportunity. That gap, Steve, could be years. I mean, how long did it take us to yeah, get well, to the, phase well, one? Well, that, the, the point is, is for me, I think it's bullish to have a certain amount of time between the two phases because it keeps shorties on their heels. Well, the... the the absurdity is that we created a problem and we slowly don't solve it and we actually get more bullish. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what's happened here. I mean, and I realize that there is a fundamental problem. And in fact, we're not a, politi a political show, but we know on both sides of the aisle, there's, there's certainly unanimity in terms of what we might need to do in terms of our China policy. But when you get back to it and what's really rallying, by the way, Asia is really rallying. Emerging markets of which China is 40 plus percent have been outperforming. So if you think about where we are here for stocks, um, Mega cap tech, of which a lot of it is Asia exposed, has really been what's been outperforming. And I know we're going to talk about Microsoft. We seem to talk about Apple every day. But the triple Qs are outperforming the S&P, which is up 12.5%, which means triple Qs are up almost 16.5% since October 3rd low. So, you, That's you know, I think the mar what the market was expecting, though, after phase one, well, at least what I was expecting was maybe a couple of months later. But we heard President Trump say he could wait until after the election. That, to me, allows you a window of opportunity to maybe sell the print or sell the news. So but do you believe that, by the way? I mean, on, on how long he's going to wait? Do you think, you think he or? can really wait until after the election? I, I think he's going to hold it. I think he's going to hold it out because I don't think he, he thinks he can get a deal done 
before the election, so he makes it as if it's his choice. But a lot of that is after. posturing, too, where you're basically to totally. Toting, totally. I will be here after the yes. election. Yes. You know, Guy, I wish we had the chart. I should have done it. It's my fault. If you charted the S&P 500 versus the Fed's balance sheet expansion since October, it's a they're perfectly one correlated. I mean, perfectly correlated. Two to one. Yeah, and it, we've, it's not like we haven't talked about it. It's, you know, you've talked about it a number of times. We've talked about it on the show. I mean, that's clearly what's driving this ship. Now, again, it doesn't matter. If you own a stock, it goes from $5 to $10. The reasons why don't matter. You have twice as much money that you did a week or so ago. That's a great thing. But don't confuse that with fundamentals of these companies, because quite frankly, fundamentals for most of this market have been thrown out the window. With that said, there are sectors the fundamentals, I think, are working, and we've outlined those. Look at healthcare, for example. A name like Eli Lilly continues to make all-time highs. Merck trading around all-time highs. So big cap pharma, which fundamentals, I think, are behind it, continue but to work. could you say that the fundamentals are, are just that, liquidity issues in the market? Because when the Fed was shrinking the balance sheet and tightening, that was a reason why people were exiting. So the same correlation you saw in the S&P was the same correlation we see now back then. So now it's the reverse. So now they, they might not be loosening, they might not be cutting, but they are expanding the balance sheet but, yet again. I think we have to be careful here because I think that, Tim, when we look at who our audience is, right, the audience that's watching, listening to Fast Money, let's assume a lot of the people driving home tonight, they're, they're individual investors. They're not buying and selling or stopping their 401k on the Federal Reserve on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. There's two markets out there. There's the investor who's gonna put cash in month after month, year after year, saving for retirement. And then there's the high frequency traders who maybe they just trade only on the Fed balance sheet. I don't know. Well, so it, who's in charge? What I, I think we have found that passive investing certainly seems to be winning the day. And, and whether you're Graham Dodd or whether you're uh, you know, someone that is following fundamentals over time. And basically, we've said this before, uh, money is made over time. It's also lost very quickly, which means if you stay the course, that's typically been the right thing to do. Um, I, I continue to believe that both the memory of 2008, 2009, uh, and some of these volatile moments of politics are the things that keep people up at night. I don't think anybody's worried about a 10% drawdown. Um, and I think the folks that you're referring to um, are very comfortable with having money in the market as long as they feel they can trust the market. And we've had these bouts uh, where people have not been sure whether it's been flash crashes, whether it's been the dynamic. trust it if like it's just the, the market Fed that's sort of the wind behind the sales. It, it's hard to. It really is, because I think that any change in Fed posture will have a dramatic impact on this market. No, I agree with that. And Steve, I think, makes a fantastic point, was back a year or so ago when they were draining liquidity, was that the same type of thing? I would push back and say, I think that's when the market finally looked at fundamentals and said, hey, wait a second, maybe these stocks don't deserve necessarily the valuations that they were awarded. But that's what makes markets, and that's a different conversation. Okay.